welcome to this time of worship at Bethel Presbyterian Church, where this week we're looking at one of the most unusual prophets in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. Habakkuk doesn't go to the people for God. Instead, he is angry with God, and he goes to God about what he sees. So stay with us, because this is going to be a wonderful message about changing people's hearts. And with one heart and one voice, I'd ask that you uh, stand wherever you're at or sing out as loud as you want to join with us in worship with our hymn of praise this morning. Let's worship together. Well, now I'd like to ask you all to please join with me as we open up in prayer for this morning. Let's pray. Gracious, most heavenly Father, we just come to you uh, to worship you fully with open hearts and expectation that you will show up, that your Holy Spirit will be not only here in this building, but in our homes as we worship you together. Unite us, O Lord, by that Spirit. Draw us closer to you. Allow the songs and the prayers and the message that we hear Grab a hold of our hearts in such a way, in such a way that we would be captivated by your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, as we pray, we lift up uh, the request and, and, and the uh, prayers that lay heavy on our hearts for our families, for our friends, our neighbors, for our state, and for our country. Lord, we lift up those who were in the, the, the path of the Hurricane Laura and the devastation that they uh, uh, encountered. And we just pray that, that, that people all across would run to help and to be there for folks as they rebuild these pieces. 
So much has happened in our world, O oh God, and it is so easy to only see the dark. Lord, let us be the light. And let us be the light for folks that points directly back to you. Gracious Lord Jesus, again, I thank you. I thank you for what you have done on the cross, how you count us as clean, we who place our full faith and belief in you. In every way, we have missed the mark, and we understand this. But because of you and what you have done, we are clean and we are forgiven. And that we are internally grateful for a gift and a price that we could never pay back. Thank you for your grace, dear God. Be with us now as we worship you. Be with us now as we continue to hear about your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I'd like for you to all to join with me in stating uh, what we believe with the Nicene Creed, a creed that is, has been formulated to help the church unite themselves under what they believe about the triune God. Would you please recite this with me now? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from might, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now I'd like for our, all the kids to gather around as we bring up our Director of Family and Children's Ministries, Carrie Horst, for our children's message. Good morning, guys. My name is Carrie, and I'm the Director of Family and Children's Ministries here at Bethel. And I'm so excited that you and I get to be together in this moment. Now, I have a question for you. Do you by chance have a best friend or maybe a group of really good close friends that you spend a lot of time with? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, well, actually, more than a couple, it was about 10 years ago, I actually went and lived in another country, and I didn't know anybody. In fact, the group of people that I was going with, I met them the week before I left. So I flew thousands of miles away from home with people who I barely knew to go and do something that God had called me to do, that he wanted me to do. And I was so excited, but I was nervous because I didn't know anybody. Well, here's the deal. That first year, I spent time with about four people pretty much all the time, and then the next couple years was about the same. And these people became some of my best friends. And it was because we lived and we worked and we hung out all the time. And let's be honest, they were the only people from my home country who I could talk to because everyone else spoke a different language. And I was so thankful for these friends because they loved me and supported me and treated me like family and encouraged me to follow Jesus more and better and closer. And I was wondering if you have any kind of friends like that. You see, today in Sunday School, we're actually going to be talking about all about friendship. And we're going to be doing it for the whole month. And because friendship is important to God. In fact, the Bible talks about friendship and how friendship can be a good thing. Because like I said, good friends encourage us and support us and point us to Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that there is no greater love than a friend who lays down their life for their other friends. It's also important, however, that you choose the right kind of friends. And I'm not saying you can't be friendly with everybody, but you're really close friends. The Bible warns about having friends who don't support you and don't encourage you and don't point you to Jesus. Can you imagine if I had gone to this country and I'd been surrounded by people who didn't encourage me in my faith with Jesus? What would my life have been like while I was there? 
So the next time that you look at your friends and you think, um, you decide, should this be my close friend or should we just be kind of friendly? Ask yourself and ask God to give you wisdom and to say, God, is this the right kind of friend that I should be spending all of my time with? Okay, let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for these kids. I thank you for the fact that they are home with their families right now, dear Jesus. God, I thank you for the gift of friends and how that is such an important thing in our lives and how it's, they support us and they encourage us. Lord, I ask that you would give us wisdom when we choose who are going to be our close friends, the people who will love and support us. Oh, God, help us make those decisions. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, there's a lot of ways that you can join us for worship here at Bethel Presbyterian Church. One way is what you're doing right now at our 11 o'clock Bethel at Home worship service. It's our online worship service that we've been doing since March. But we also are offering in-person worship opportunities too, right here at our church on the corner of Bethel and Reed Roads. At 9.30 a.m. is our traditional worship service, and at 11 o'clock is our contemporary worship service. And we have taken as many precautions as we can to make sure that we are sitting in every other pew, disinfecting in between worship services, uh, making sure that social distance guidelines are in place, and also keeping the singing down to a low uh, hum uh, instead of belting it out. So if you uh, feel comfortable with that, we'd love to have you back uh, here with us on campus, or for now, continue to enjoy our online worship service opportunity. We also want to celebrate our prayer and popsicle night that happened last Sunday, a wonderful turnout. And we just also want to implore us all to continue to pray for our children and students and families, our parents and teachers and administrators, as now more than ever they are united together on the same team to help educate uh, their children, help educate these children in this time of our COVID shutdown and different ways of doing school. It can seem uncertain, it can seem scary and stressful. So let us join together to continue to pray for them and support them as best we can. I also want to let you know that we have a fun event coming up on September 19th at 5.30 p.m. for our families, and families meaning families of children or families with students, uh, high school, junior high age, fun for all the families. We're going to have an all, uh, um, a game night, excuse me, I stumbled over that, a game night for us on September 19th at 5.30 p.m. Dinner will be provided. It'll be pizza. If you want to bring extra stuff for your own uh, family, that is fine. And we're going to set it up so that everyone is socially distanced and that you get your own pizza at, at your own table so there won't be exchanging back and forth. But it's just going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do it outside, and we'd love for you all to be here for that, to join in something fun to do uh, this September, uh, September 19th at 5.30 p.m. We do need RSVPs, and so if you would please do that, RSVP to Carrie Horst at the email listed below, or you can contact the church office at the email listed below or by calling the phone number. Either way, let us know if you're able to attend and how many people are in your party, and we will begin to make plans to make sure a table is set up as well as enough pizza is ordered. Don't miss out on this fun event to be together. Lastly, I would like to also tell you about our grief share ministry that is going to be happening September 13th. Signups are still happening. You can contact the church office to let us know if you would like to be a part of that. And grief share is a national organization, a ministry that's very biblically based on how we walk through the grief process. If you or someone that you know has lost someone special and is going through grief, they don't have to go through it alone. And this ministry allows people to be together, to walk through those phases, and to move towards healing. It is very powerful, and we highly recommend it. So if you'd like to sign up, please let us know before September 13th. And now is the time of our worship service where we also talk about how to give offerings and tithes. And we know that in this time, this crazy time where people may have been furloughed or lost their job, if you're unable to, to do that, that is completely fine and we understand. And for those that are, there are ways, multiple ways that you can send your offering in to us. You can go to our church webpage, www.bethelatreed.com, and at the top right-hand corner where it says online giving, Click on that and follow the instructions, and your money will be sent to us electronically. You can also go to your own banking institution and log in and click on their e-bill pay or something similar to that. Follow those instructions, and the bank will send the check to us uh, through their system. Lastly, you can handwrite that check and either send it in the mail 
to our church, or you can bring it up to our church Monday through Friday from 9 to 6 o'clock p.m. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to our announcements, and uh, we hope that you can take part in, in a variety of, of the things that we're still doing here at the church, and we're able to do that because of the generosity uh, of you, of being able to continue to support these ministries. Let's now open our hearts and our minds and, and come to the Lord in a posture of, of continued worship as we bring up Dr. Jerry Kasberg for his message today. Let's continue to worship. Thank you, Mike. Well, today we look at a prophet that uh, cries out a prayer that probably everyone hearing this or watching this has cried out in their life. It's a cry from the depth of his being. Now, this comes from the 31st, the 35th book of the Bible, the book of Habakkuk. And uh, even though you might not be familiar with this minor prophet after today, he just may be one of your favorite prophets. Before we talk about the Lord, let's talk with him. Join me in a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all that it holds for this opportunity to open your word. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would do what your Holy Spirit does best. Take words that are written on a page and write them on our hearts that we might be transformed, changed to be more like you. If there would be anything that would hinder us hearing the message you would have for us right now, I pray you would remove it. For we've come to sit at the feet of Jesus to become more like Jesus. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, the book of Habakkuk starts with a lament. And a lament is a cry of grief from the depth of one's soul. It, it's almost like shaking your fist at God because you are so frustrated and so angry. That the thing that is on your heart is so deeply felt that you just let it out before God. Hear Habakkuk's lament. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Now, if you look at that, that's quite a complaint. Habakkuk has major issues with God. And I suspect, like Habakkuk, that at times we do as well. Habakkuk was uh, very aware of all the difficult things that were happening uh, that surrounded him. And he cries out of his pain. He is the only prophet that uh, cries out not to the people for God, but cries out to God for the people. He sees violence. He sees injustice. He sees wrongdoing and he must speak forth to God. These doers, these wrongdoers have the upper hand. Now, he doesn't pray for himself, but he prays on behalf of others, especially those that are facing injustice. Now, as you read the text, you'll get a sense that Habakkuk has been doing this repeatedly over and over for a long time, asking God to act, asking God to intervene, to set things right. And it appears that God has not heard him or that God refuses to act. So it's out of this deep sense of frustration that he cries out to God, How long, O oh Lord? Must I call to you for help and you do not listen? Now, the thing is, God does answer Habakkuk's lament. In verse 5, 
We read, look among the nations, God says, and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. God says, hey, Habakkuk, I'm at work. You see, Habakkuk only saw the situation as we might see through a rolled up piece of paper. When you look at a situation like this, you only see part of the story. And God is telling Habakkuk, I am at work. Even though you do not see it, I am at work. And you're missing the bigger picture. Now, it gets worse because in God's response, he says, you're not going to believe what I am doing, what I'm about to do. It's so amazing. And for Habakkuk, the answer was unsettling and astounding. You see, God was going to destroy the injustice among his people, the nation of Judah, by bringing the Babylonians, another nation, in. And this other nation was an immoral nation. It was an evil nation. But they will be the instrument of God's judgment. They will overwhelm and they will punish the people of God. Now, immediately, Habakkuk, he comes unglued. And, and, and basically gets in God's face, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. He says, they're wicked people. And we find in verse 12, O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O oh rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look as traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? So here's what he says. God, are you crazy? You're using people more wicked than your people to punish the wickedness of your people. That doesn't make sense. And, and, and here's what Habakkuk does. I, he almost loved this part, the gumption that he has. In chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. I will stand defiant. I'm going to climb to the highest place. I'm going to look God in the eye because I've asked him a question that he cannot answer. Now, if I were God... I think this would be an appropriate time for a lightning bolt strike. But that's not what God does. We find that the Lord answers Habakkuk. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits it's appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So here's what God says. Habby, take a note. Write this down, but write it so big that nobody misses it. Write it so big that even a runner running by is able to read it. Here's my purpose for the world. I have an appointed time. And my works, my actions 
are about to happen, but you need to wait. That was the word. It's coming, but you need to wait. Now, I don't know about you, but most of us and Americans are not known for their waiting. We do not like to wait. We have waiting rooms that we try to avoid because we'll be there for a good while. Anytime we have to wait, we get frustrated. We, we want to, because we're impatient. But the word wait in scripture means to be patient. And the word patient in scripture means to suffer long. We don't like it. We don't like to suffer long. We don't like to wait. But see, in the Bible, waiting is a, is a way to actively trust that God is in control, that he's in charge, that he, what he says will happen will happen. Waiting is actually a great expression of faith. It's being open and receptive to all that God has. Trusting that God does know best and will bring to our lives and around our lives a good completion. That's what he will do. He speaks to Habakkuk and he says, Habakkuk, you need to wait. Now, Habakkuk is puffed up. He's full of himself. And it's this word, wait, is where God takes a pen and pops his puffiness. He lets the air out of Habakkuk. God says, I have this. It's in my control. You need to trust me. In fact, he says in Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith. To be right with God means to trust him, to live our lives humbly, recognizing that he is sovereign and in control. This is the text that changed Martin Luther's life, the, uh, the centerpiece of the Reformation, that we don't live by works. We don't live by what we think is. We're not righteous by our works. We're not righteous by what we think is right. We are righteous when we live by faith. The Apostle Paul repeated this in the book of Romans and in, to the church at Galatia. Faithfulness is a willingness to trust that God knows best. And will bring to our lives and to the world a good completion. That's what faith does. I love this quote I came up upon this week. It says, even when you can't see the hand of God, you can trust the heart of God. Even when you can't see the hand of God, you and I can trust the heart of God. At Princeton University in the mathematics building, there is a marble fireplace. And written in German, above this fireplace is this. God is subtle, but he is not malicious. You see, God is never malicious in his dealings with you and me and humankind. Whatever he does, he does for our good. The Apostle Paul spoke of the goodness and the kindness of God and his amazing grace and way with us when he wrote Romans 8.28, a verse that many of us are familiar with. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. 
Now, this is an important verse for all that it says, but it's, it's almost more important for what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that everything that happens is going to be good. It doesn't say that God causes evil. It doesn't say that everything will turn out okay. What it does say is that God is at work in our world and especially in the lives of his children. And he works for our good. His purpose is to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And to that good end, God does all things. The good, and he allows the bad and the difficult. He allows that so that good might happen happen. In God's economy, nothing is a waste. He uses, utilizes everything for good. Now Habakkuk, who starts out complaining, lamenting, shaking his fist, standing toe to toe with God, angry because what he sees and believes God to be idle, discovers in this conversation with God that he is, in, that he is sovereign and in control and good, and God is calling him to wait and to trust. And so at the very end of these three chapters, you have one of the most trusting statements in all of the scriptures. It is an amazing thing. This place of faith that Habakkuk finds himself. Habakkuk 3. Though the fig trees should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the field yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The God, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Habakkuk affirmed that even though from all appearances things are going south, things are headed in a bad direction, there isn't even a sign of hope. He affirms that the Lord is in charge. Something that we might think of these days in the midst of questions and difficulties. Habakkuk might have said, though the virus rages, though the economy trembles and may head south, though the government runs in chaotic circles, though the heart of some of our cities seem to be collapsing. Even if everything that we can count on falters, still, Habakkuk would say, I will trust in the Lord. I will put my confidence in God. I will not waver. Corrie ten Boom, who found herself in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, in very difficult situations, lost her family and uh, a sister, and uh, it was just horrific. She writes, There is no pit so deep that God isn't deeper still. There is no place... There's no difficult place that you will find yourself that God isn't below you, actively at work for your good. That is the message of Habakkuk. In fact, this book that starts with a complaint and a lament, actually, as you read the text, has directions to the choir master. 
Habakkuk ends his book with a song. He ends with rejoicing. Because God has never been idle. God is continuously at work for the good of those who love him. This is a book of hope. This is good news for us in our world this day. This book has been a blessing to me this week as I have encountered the news as you have. And so take it to heart. Make these pages of Habakkuk well-worn as you go back and identify with his grief and his questions and then discover that the righteous will live by faith, trusting in the one who holds us in the palm of his hand. Even in difficult times, God is at work. And in one of the most difficult times in all of human history is where God's son, Jesus Christ, allowed himself to be nailed to the cross on Friday. It couldn't have gotten bleaker. It couldn't have gotten darker. It was apparently looked from the human perspective, that this was the end. But it was out of that darkness came the resurrection. Because God was not idle. He forgave the sin of humankind, of you and me, by faith in Jesus Christ. And so it's a meal that we remember the darkness of Friday. Because it was Thursday night that Jesus prepared the disciples for Friday. He took an ordinary loaf of bread and he said, this is my body. And it's going to be broken for you. Do this. And when you break bread like this, you remember me. In the darkness of my broken body, know that it was meant for the brightness of a new day in a relationship between you and your heavenly Father by faith. And that same meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Drink this. And as often as you drink this, drink it in memory of me, is through the darkness of shed blood that the brightness of eternal life comes because the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, sins cannot be forgiven. And so Jesus Christ shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And now as you sit around at home, I would invite you to get a glass of juice and some bread and that you would share a time of communion. That you would stand in the midst of the darkness of the cross and discover the brightness of eternal life as you share with each other the words of institution that the body of Christ is broken for them and the blood of Christ is shed. Take a moment and do that. And now I would like to pray. Join me in a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that through these simple elements, there is a divine, eternal truth of our total forgiveness that through the darkness of the death of Christ on Good Friday comes the brightness of eternal life on Easter Sunday. And we enter into that darkness knowing that you're not idle, but actively forgiving us 
so we can walk in the light. Thank you for these elements and this reminder. We thank you for the prophet Habakkuk. We thank you for what he discovered by faith, by trusting, by waiting. Thank you that he knew and knows now that you are never idle, but always active, working to the good of those who love you. We thank you for these things. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us join our contemporary worship folks as we, uh, we raise our hearts and voices to the Lord. the 
this time of worship. May we rethink our complaints. May we know that no matter what we face, God is not idle, but is at work for our good. So go through this day, this week, trusting in the one who is working toward your good. Even when you can't see it, go in peace to love and serve him. Amen.